Hello and welcome. Last week we started talking about probability. We talked about combinatorics or counting, and we gave an introduction to probability, the idea that events can have a number assigned to them between zero and one, which tells us how likely it is that that event occurred. And we talked about easy things such as if we have a fair die, the probability of each number occurring is one divided by six. This week, we're going to move on to some more advanced techniques for probability. We're going to study concepts of probability, conditional probability, and probability trees. First, let's talk about some concepts of probability. Before we go on, let me quickly remind you about the union and intersection. We had sets A and B. Everything which is in A or in set B is the union of A and B. The elements which are in both A and B are the intersection of A and B. For example, let's suppose we have one die. The sample space for rolling one die is the set containing the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And we're going to assume that we have a fair die. In other words, we're going to assume that each of these simple events are equally likely. And then we're asked two questions. What is the probability of rolling a number which is even and greater than three? What is the probability of rolling a number which is even or greater than three? We need two sets. Let A be the set of the even numbers, that's 2, 4, and 6, and let B be the set of numbers which are greater than 3. The first question was the question of and. What is the probability that we roll a number which is even and greater than 3? We're looking at the set A intersection B. Probability of A intersection B must be 2 divided by 6 or 1 divided by 3. For the OR question, what is the probability that we have a number which is even OR greater than 3? We want the even numbers A together with all of the numbers which are greater than 3. So we want A union B. We want the numbers 2, 4, 5, and 6. And the probability of A union B must be 4 divided by 6 or 2 divided by 3. Let me remind you of the addition principle from last week. If we're trying to count the number of elements in A union B, we do the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B. And then so that we don't count some elements twice, we subtract the number of elements in A into section B. We have a similar formula for probability. The probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersection B. It's the same formula, but with N replaced by P. Next example. Now let's suppose that we have two dice, two fair dice. What is the probability that the sum is either 5 or 10? Question 2. What is the probability that either the sum is greater than 9? or both dice show the same number. Question one, first of all, what is the probability of even a five or a 10? We need two sets. First, let's suppose A is the event that the sum is equal to five. We can have one and four, two and three, three and two, or four and one. And next, let's suppose B is the event that the sum is equal to 10. How can we get 10? We can have 4 and 6, 5 and 5, or 6 and 4. Before we go on, let me remark that the intersection of these two sets is the empty set. So we don't need to worry about calculating the probability of A intersection B, because the probability of A intersection B must be 0. 
Now we're ready to calculate the probability of A union. The probability for a sum is 5 or 10. And because the intersection is 0, we're just doing the probability of A plus the probability of B. A has four elements, so the probability of A is 4 divided by 36. B has three elements, so the probability of B is 3 divided by 36. And then, of course, the answer must be 7 over 36. Our second question was, what is the probability that the sum is strictly greater than 9, or both dice show the same number? Again, we need two sets, which I'm going to call now C and D. The event that the sum is greater than 9, how can we get a number which is bigger than 9? 4 and 6, 5 and 5. 5 and 6, 6 and 4, 6 and 5 and 6 and 6. What is the event that both dice show the same number? 1, 1, 2 and 2, 3 and 3, 4 and 4, 5 and 5 and 6 and 6. Now, before we go on, note that the intersection between these two sets is not the empty set. 5, 5 and 6, 6 are in both sets. Now we're going to use the formula. The probability of C union D is equal to the probability of C plus the probability of D minus the probability of C intersection D. What do we have? C has six elements, so we have six over 36. D also has six elements, so plus six over 36. C intersection D has two elements, so we need to do minus two over 36. And you can check that this is the same as 5 over 18. Another useful technique for calculating probabilities is using complements. A is this white circle, and the complement of A is everything not in A. Everything that's in the sample space, but not in A. And we have a nice formula which says the probability of an event E is equal to 1 minus the probability of E complement. This is a nice formula for us because sometimes it's going to be easier to calculate 1 minus the probability of E complement than it is to calculate the probability of E directly. Let me show you some examples. Suppose that a box containing 45 whiteboard markers is delivered to Istanbul Arkan University. Let's suppose that nine of these markers are red and the remaining markers are black. Your teacher is given 10 markers at random. He doesn't want to have all black markers. He wants to have at least one red marker. He has at least one red marker that he's going to be happy. What is the probability that your teacher will be happy? What is the probability that your teacher is given at least one red marker? So how could we do this? We can calculate the probability of exactly one red marker, the probability of getting exactly two reds, the probability of getting exactly three, and so on, all the way up to getting the probability of exactly nine red markers, and then we could add them all together. But there's an easier way. Let's suppose E is the event that one or more, more of the markers is red. This is what we want. We want to calculate the probability of E. But first, we're going to calculate the probability of E complement, where E complement is the event that all of the 10 markers are black. Calculating the probability of E complement is easy. How can we get 10 markers out of 36 black markers? 36 choose 2, 10. How can we get 10 markers chosen out of 45? 45 choose 10. And then the probability that we want, probability of E, must be 1 minus this. 1 minus 36 choose 10 divided by 45 choose 10. And I'll leave it for you to calculate that 
probability of E is approximately 0 0.92. Next example. In a class of 30 students, what is the probability that at least two students have the same birthday? And just to be precise, I mean the same month and the same day, but not the same year. And just to make our calculation a little bit easier, we're going to ignore the existence of the 29th of February. So we're going to assume that there are 365 days in the year. And we're going to assume that each day is equally likely to be somebody's birthday. Then the number of elements in the sample space must be 365 for the first student, multiplied by 365 for the second student, multiplied by 365 for the first student, and so on. Because we've got 30 students, it's going to be 365 multiplied by 365 multiplied by 365 multiplied by, etc. 30 times, or 365 to the power of 30. Now, let E be the event that two or more people have the same birthday. This is the probability that we're trying to calculate. Instead, we're going to look at the complement of E. We're going to look at the event that all 30 students have different birthdays. First, we'll calculate the probability of E complement, and then we'll do one minus this to get the probability of E. And here's the calculation. How many elements are in E complement? How can we get all 30 students to have different birthdays? First student could have any one of 365 days for their birthday. For the second student, we want the second student to have a different birthday. So there are 364 days remaining for the second student to have their birthday on, as long as, as to be sure that the second student has a different birthday from the first student. Then for student number three, there are 363 days remaining, and so on. Because we have 30 students, the final number in this list is going to be 336. I'll leave that for you to think about. We have 365 factorial divided by 335 factorial. Or this is the same as 365 could be 30. What is the probability of E complement? It's the number of elements in E complement divided by the number of elements in the sample space. So 365 factorial divided by 335 factorial multiplied by 365 to the power of 30. And then the probability that we want is 1 minus this. And I'll leave it for you to calculate that this is approximately 0 0.706, or approximately 70.6%. In a class of 30 students, the probability that at least two students have the same birthday is approximately 70%. Our second chapter for this week is conditional probability. Sometimes the event that Sometimes the probability that an event will occur will depend on another event. For example, let's suppose A is the event Ali has cancer, and let's suppose B is the event Ali is a smoker. Then we know that these two events are connected. Whether or not Ali is a smoker will affect the probability that Ali has cancer. 
for a situation like this where we have one event depending on another event, we have something called conditional probability. And we write conditional probability like this, PA vertical line B. It means the probability of A if we already know that B occurs. We have a nice formula to calculate conditional probability. The probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of B. That's the probability that both A and B occur divided by the probability that B occurs. We can use this formula to, to solve problems like this. A bag contains red and blue marbles. Two marbles are drawn without replacement, drawn randomly without replacement. The probability of selecting a red marble and then a blue marble is 0 0.28. The probability of selecting a red marble on the first draw is 0 0.5. What is the probability of selecting a blue marble on the second draw? given that the first marble drawn was red. If we already know that the first marble is red, what is the probability that the second marble is blue? We need some events. Let's suppose R is that the first marble is red, and let's suppose that B is the event, the second marble is blue. We're asked to calculate the probability of B given R. If we know that R is true, what is the probability of B? By the formula from the previous theorem, this is the same as the probability of B intersection R divided by the probability of R. And these were given in the question. In the question, we're told that the probability of the first marble being red and the second marble being blue is 0 0.28. We're also told that the probability that the first marble is red is 0 0.5. Put these numbers into the formula and we calculate the answer to this question is 0 0.56. Let's just imagine we're rolling a die again. Your friend says that when she rolled a die, she rolled an odd number. What is the probability that your friend rolled a three? You can probably guess the answer, but we're not going to guess. We're going to use our formula. Let's let A be the event that your friend rolled number three, and let B be the event your friend rolled an odd number. We can write down the probabilities here. The probability that your friend rolled a three must be one divided by six, as long as it's a fair die. The probability that she rolled, the probability a three and she rolled an odd number, well, three is an odd number, so that's just the same as the probability of A or one of six. What is the probability that she rolled an odd number? One divided by two, because half the numbers are even and half the numbers are odd. We're asked to calculate the probability of A given B. Using the formula, that's one over six divided by one over two, or one third. Now, before we go on, we're using the formula probability of A given B is the probability of A to section B divided by the probability of B. Multiply both sides by the probability of B and then sort of swap them around. This is the same as saying that the probability of A into section B is equal to the probability of B multiplied by the probability of A given B. But 
A intersection B is just the same as B intersection A. We dissect two sets, it doesn't matter which order we write them in. We can just swap positions of A and B. So in, in the formula in the orange circle, we can also swap the positions of A and B. This must be the same as the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B given A. Now that we have this, we can say that the probability of A intersection B, is the probability of A, probability of B given A, and is also equal to the probability of B, probability of A given B. We've just done this. And then rearranging this formula, we can say that the probability of A given B is the same as the probability of A, probability of B given A divided by the probability of B. This is that's just playing with the equations to get a new equation, a new formula. My next example is the Monty Hall problem. Suppose you're on a TV game show and you're given the choice of three doors. Behind one of the doors is a car and behind the other is uh, goats. You want to open the door to, and win the car. So what you do is you, you ask to pick a door. Let's suppose you choose door number one. And then the host, who knows where the car is, asks you, um, opens another door. The host, let's say, opens door number three, and he shows you that there's a goat behind door number three. The host gives you a choice. You can stay with the door number one that you chose first, or you can change your mind and have door number two instead. What should you do? Is it your advantage to stay with door number one that you started with? Or is it to your advantage to change your mind and say that you would have door number two? This is a problem which is named after an American TV presenter called Monty Hall. And this is a problem which confuses a lot of people who haven't studied probability. situation might look like this. You might have that the car is behind door number one and goats are behind two and three. Or maybe the car is behind door number two. Or maybe the car is behind door number three. You don't know where the car is. What you're going to do is you're going to choose a door. What is the probability that the car is behind the door that you choose? That's easy, right? There's three doors. The car's behind one of the doors. So the probability that the car is behind the door that you choose must be one over three. Then the host opens another door, one of the doors which you didn't choose. And he shows you that there's a goat behind that door. Now there's two closed doors. Behind one of them is a car, and behind the other one is a goat. What is the probability that the car is behind the door that you chose? The, the door that you chose first before the host opened the door. Well, now there's two closed doors. One of them has a car behind, one of them has a goat behind. So the probability that the car is behind the door that you originally chose must be 1 over 2, right? No, that's wrong. Why? Why is it not a half? To understand this, let's look at all the possible outcomes. And just for this um, slide, let's suppose that you choose door number 1 first. Let's suppose, first of all, you choose door number one, there's a car behind door number one, there's a goat behind door number two, and there's a goat behind door number three. And just for the sake of argument, 
let's suppose the host opens door number three and shows you there's a goat behind door number three. And then he asks you, do you want to stay with door number one or do you want to change your mind and have door number two? If you don't change your mind, if you stay with door number one, then you win the car. If you change your mind and you say you want door number two instead, then you're going to lose. The second possibility is that the car is behind door number two. Again, you start by choosing door number one. The host opens door number three and he shows you there's a goat behind door number three. And he says, do you want to stay with door number one or do you want to change your mind and have door number two instead? If you stay with door number one, you lose. If you change your mind and take door number two instead, then you win. There's a third possibility. Let's suppose the car is behind door number three. First, you choose door number one. The host now opens door number two, and he shows you there's a goat behind door number two. The host asks you, do you want to stay with door number one, or do you want to change your mind and have door number three? If you stay with door number one, then you lose. If you change your mind and have door number three instead, then you win. Now look at this. If you don't change your mind, you can win one in three. If you do change your mind, you're going to win two out of three. We can see from this table that if you don't change your mind, you have a one in three chance of winning the car. But if you do change your mind, if you switch to the other door when you're offered, then you have a two over three chance of winning it. Now, these are the probabilities that what happens if you choose door number one first, but all three doors are identical, so it doesn't matter if you, which door you chose first. If you first chose door two or you first chose door three, the probabilities would be the same. If you don't change your mind, you have a one in three chance of winning. If you do change your mind, you have a two in three chance of winning. Let's think about this another way. Let's suppose that again, you originally, you choose door number one. The chance of the door behind the car, the chance that the car is behind door number one is one over three, and the chance that the car is behind either door or door three is two over three. Now let's imagine that a host doesn't open a door. Let's suppose instead the host says, you can change your choice and instead of door number one, you can have both door number two and door number three. Would you change then? Would you swap door one for door two and door three? And yes, I think you would because you know that you're getting two doors instead of one, so you get two ch chances of winning instead of one chance of winning. But remember, we know that at least one of door number two and door number three hides a goat. When the host opens a door and he shows us a goat, he doesn't tell us any information that we didn't already know, because we already knew that at least one of these doors has a goat. The host knows where the car is. He doesn't open a door at random. He always opens a door with a goat. So the host is not giving you any extra information. This means that the probabilities don't change to a half and a half. They stay at one third and two thirds. Or there's a third way to think about this problem. We can think about this problem using conditional probabilities. Let C be the event that door number one has a car behind it. Then the complement of C is door number one does not have a car behind it, or that's the same as saying door number one has a goat behind it. 
and let E be the event that the host opens the door with a goat behind it. We know that the probability that a car is behind door number one is a third, so the probability there's goats behind door number one is two thirds. We also know that if there's a car behind door number one, the host will open either door two or door number three and show us a goat. So the probability of E given C is one. We always open the door of a goat. If there is a goat behind door number one, the car's behind door number two or door number three, the host opens the other door and he shows us a goat. The probability that he shows us a goat given C complement is also one. And then we can put these numbers into our formula. The formula from the previous theorem, the probability of C given E is the probability of C, probability of E given C, divided by the probability of E. And I'm going to be a little bit quick here. I'm going to leave this for you to check later. You can check that as we go through this calculation, we get to one third. The probability that the car is behind door number one, given that the host opens a goat with a door, stays at one third. The host doesn't change anything when he opens a door, he doesn't change the probabilities. So, the conclusion if you're playing this game, it's, in, it's always in your advantage to switch the door if you're given a chance. Our final chapter for today is probability trees. Let's start with this example. Let's suppose we have a box which contains three red balls and two yellow balls. We're going to randomly take two balls out of the box without putting them back in, without replacing them. What is the probability that the second ball that we take out is yellow? To understand this situation, we can draw something called a probability tree. We're going to randomly take a ball out of the box. The first ball that we take out of the box might be yellow or it might be red. Because there's two yellow balls and three red balls, the probability that the first ball is yellow is 2 over 5, and the probability that the first ball is red is 3 over 5. Then we're going to take a second ball out of the box. Now, we need to think about what the probability is happening here. After we take one ball out, there's four balls remaining. So all of these probabilities are going to be divided by four. First, if, we, if the first ball we take out is yellow, then there's one yellow ball remaining, and there's three red balls remaining. So the probability that the second ball is yellow must be one over four, and the probability that the second ball is red must be 3 over 4. Next, if the first ball that we choose is red, then we're left with two yellows and two reds. The probability that the second ball is yellow must then be 2 over 4, and the probability that the second ball is red must also be 2 over 4. And along each of these branches of the tree, we can multiply the probabilities together. We're interested in the probability that the second ball is yellow. 
if we have yellow, yellow, that's 2 over 5 multiplied by 1 over 4, or 1 over 10. Or we could have first red, and then second yellow. Probability is 3 over 5 multiplied by 2 over 4, or 3 over 10. Probability of going this way is 1 over 10. Probability of going this way is 3 over 10. And then we add these numbers together. The probability of yellow, yellow, plus the probability of red, yellow, must be 1 over 10 plus 3 over 10, or 2 over 5. This means the probability of the second ball we take out is 2 over 5. And common sense tells us this is correct. We have five balls, two are yellow, so the probability that the second ball we choose should be 2 over 5. There's a mistake here. Next example is about tennis. We have two men, Boris and Kia, and they are playing tennis. The tennis game has the rule that the first player to win two sets wins the match. In each set, the, the probability that Kia wins the set is two over three. And therefore, the probability that Boris wins is 1 over 3. We're asked three questions. Find the probability that Boris wins the match. Find the probability that three sets are played. Question number three. Find the probability that the player who wins the first set also wins the tennis match. The probability tree looks like this. In each set, the probability is the same. Two thirds that Kia wins, one third that Boris wins. If Kia wins the first set and the second set, then the game finishes. Kia wins the first set and Boris wins the second set, then they play a third set. If maybe Kia wins or maybe Boris wins. Likewise, if Boris wins the first two sets, that's the end of the game. But if Boris wins the first set, Kia wins the second set, then they must play a third set. I filled in the probabilities of each branch and I've multiplied them together. The probability of KK is 4 over 9, the probability of KBK is 4 over 27, etc. We are asked to calculate the probability that Boris wins. How can Boris win? We could have KBB, we could have BB, or we could have BKB. Probability of these, if we add them together, PKBB plus PBKB plus PBB, you can see must be 7 divided by 27. What is the probability that three sets are played? Well, it's these four. These are the four outcomes which involve three sets being played. We need to calculate the probability of KBK plus the probability of KBB plus the probability of BKK plus the probability of BKB. Add these four numbers together and you can check that we get 4 divided by 9. The third question was, what is the probability that the player who wins the first set also wins the match? If Kia wins both sets, then Kia wins. Kia wins the first set and the third set, he wins. If Boris wins the first set and the third set, then Boris wins. If Boris wins both the first two sets, then Boris wins.
we need to calculate the probability of KK plus the probability of KBK plus the probability of BKB plus the probability of BB. And I'm going to leave it for you to check that the answer to this question is 7 divided by 9. Next example. Let's suppose we're given a probability tree, we're given this one, and we're asked to calculate the probability of B. So we find B, here's a B, here's a B, here's a B, and there's another B just here. We need to calculate the probability of getting to each of these Bs, and then we need to add them together. Probability of RMB, RMB, 3 over 10 multiplied by 2 over 5 multiplied by 1 over 3. Next, the probability of RNB, 3 over 10 multiplied by 3 over 5 multiplied by 2 over 3. The probability of SOB, 7 over 10. 1 over 5, 1 over 2. And then finally, we also need the probability of SB. 7 over 10 multiplied by 4 over 5. Put these numbers in, multiply them together, and then add them up. I will leave it for you to check that the answer to this problem is 79 over 100, or 0 0.79, or 79%. And then the final example for today's class. Let's suppose that Ron Weasley has a bag with seven blue sweets and three blue sweets in it. He takes a sweet, a sweet at random from the bag and then he puts it back in the bag. Next, he picks a sweet at random from the bag and then he eats it. He doesn't put it back in the bag because he's eaten it. And then finally, he picks a third sweet at random. We are asked to draw a probability tree to represent the situation. Now, remember, we have written at the top, we have seven blue sweets and we have three red sweets. The first sweet might be blue or it might be red. The probability that the first sweet is blue is 7 over 10. The probability that the second, the first sweet is red is 3 over 10. Then Ron puts the sweet back in the bag and then he chooses, he randomly chooses a sweet. Because he's put it back in the bag, there's still seven blue sweets in the bag and three red sweets in the bag. So again, the probabilities are going to be the same. Seven over 10, three over 10. And then after he, then he eats the sweet. That means there's only nine sweets remaining. And he picks a third sweet from the bag. If he eats a blue sweet, then there's only six blue sweets remaining. The probability that the third sweet is blue must be six over nine. The probability that the third sweet is red is three over nine. If, however, he, the sweet he eats is red, then there's seven blue sweets remaining, but only two red sweets remaining. So the probabilities here are going to be seven over nine and two over nine. And then the bottom half is repeated, 6 over 9, 3 over 9, 7 over 9, 2 over 9. We pick the information that we need out of the question, and we've used that to draw a probability tree. After we have our probability tree, we could answer whichever questions we need to answer about this situation. 
And that is the end of today's lesson about probability. Next week, we're going to study a different type of mathematics called graph theory. Are there any questions?